Turn with me this morning to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. As I started last week and told you, it's been uh, since 2012 since I've really ministered on power of blessing, and, and I didn't realize it had been that long. But it's part of our foundation here uh, that, we, that we believe is fundamental in, in how we view uh, the things of God and how we view how God sees us and how he wants us to filter through what he was saying. And um, so we, every few years I'll go back and revisit this. And since this time, the CDs in there in the bookstore have gone around the world, been translated in other languages. The books have gone around, you know, over, over uh, well, it was two years ago I, I looked and there was 50,000 copies that, are, that have been sold. And uh, so God is just causing it to become alive. And as I saw this weekend, uh, really had, had still deep significance. And uh, I want us to, to be a house that understands this, not that... We just hear about it, but it's a lifestyle that we practice. Now, when I use the word blessing, I'm not talking about material things, how many houses you had and cars you have and, and all that God's stuff, the stuff God's given you. That's not the blessing I'm talking about. It can be part of that. But the word blessing in the, in the original in the Greek is eulogeo. In the, in the Hebrew, it's called barak or barakah. And it means in the, in the Greek, it simply means uh, as a eulogy, as you'd you would have somebody that at a funeral service, you'd give a eulogy. It means to speak well and speak large of. In Barak, it means a little bit different that. It's blessing, but it's one of those words that's just pregnant, full of all kinds of meaning. And it means the idea to declare God's intention for something, not just reporting the way that it is. So when I talk about blessing, we're talking about a pro prophetic level, meaning declare what you want something to be, not the way that it is. And a lot of times in prayer, we report to God how bad the problem is, and we never declare the solution, his word. What does his word say in that? And whatever we magnify, we're saying that I believe this is the stronger part. If we magnify the problem, we're saying is the problem is stronger than God himself. Psalms 34 says, oh, magnify the Lord with me, which means make God bigger than the problem. And when he is exalted, then everything else comes under submission and and falling into a place of, of submission under that word as well. And so uh, you've got sh many, a lot. I've got a whole file full of stories where people have written me over the last few years and told me we, we've blessed our family, we've blessed our marriages, we've blessed these things, and you learn how to do that and uh, how it's completely turned things around and revolutionized where we are. I want to start this morning, Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And we'll pick it up in, in verse 11. This is typically what we'd call the five-fold ministry. Uh, the Bible doesn't call it that. It means the, the gifts are given to the church. These are governmental gifts given to the church. I want us to see in that context that God puts blessing connected with that. Look at verse 11. As soon as I get there, my new Bible, there it is. Somebody moved it. It says, I'm afraid... That's Galatians. I'm not afraid. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. All right. Restart. Here we are. And he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some to apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Didn't To some. Didn't give all of them that there's not every pastor, not every teacher, not every apostle that has this, this level of governmental. But he says, I've given to them for the equipping. And the word equipping literally means not just training, but means for strengthening for a specific responsibility. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry or the work of serving, for the edifying or the strengthening, building up, making stronger, foundationally all the way to the top, edifying of the body of Christ till we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. In other words, all of these ministry gifts are there to bring us to a unity of the faith of the Son of God and for strengthening us so that we will have a greater knowledge of the Son of God. Now, to a perfect man, the word teleos there means finished or completed. Till a completed one, till we've reached a point to where that we're ready to ride without a, you know, training wheels on the bicycle. To the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Not the stature of a church, not the stature of a, of a, a doctrinal statement, but the stature of Jesus himself. He is the measuring rod that we use for that. That we should no longer, verse 14, be children tossed to and fro, 
carried about here and there about every wind of doctrine. We're into this thing, now we're into this thing, this is a new thing, now we're into this thing, and it's just confusing. So we're not like that. Those are children, children that, are, that, that have no direction, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into things into him, not unto him, into him, who is the head of Christ, from whom the knowledge of whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body. I want us to look primarily at verse 15. And in the, in the connection, in the context, he's talking about these ministry gifts are there to bring us to a finished person, a, a mature person, and that we're functioning in the body of Christ, one with another. We're each gathered for the purpose of, of sharing, strengthening one another. We have something to give. The American church is more in the idea of what do I get out of it? Where the, the New Testament church teaches the fact is I am there to put something back in so blood flows through me. There's a joint and a part of me that's connected together that has an effect on that. Sometimes more or less in, in North America than most places I've traveled around the world is that the, the pastor is the one-man show. It all revolves around his teaching. And therefore, worship is weak, and it's all about the teaching, all about the pastor, about the one man. And that's not the biblical sense of what he's saying. It's about we all come together, want to have the psalm, a hymn, a spiritual song, and that just doesn't happen in the four walls on Sunday morning. But we come together and we join what God has given us to be strengthened and stronger in through that. Now notice, he says, for the purpose, by being this mature person, the stature of Christ, speaking the truth in love. Every time I've heard someone use this scripture, they were using it, the idea was, I need to, I love you, and I'm going to tell you the truth, which means it's code for buckle up, because I'm fixing to unload on you right here. But the scripture is not saying that at all. It says, by you, the one speaking the truth is the one who grows by it, not just the one who's hearing you speak truth. But the one who is speaking truth, and it's not the truth there, is not just information that you're sharing about someone else or to someone else, but the word truth there, you've heard me say over the years a number of times, truth, aletheia, is the manifested reality of how God sees something or sees someone. So he's saying truth is speaking how God feels about one another. And when you speak what God feels about someone or to another, then you grow by it. You don't grow by telling people off. You don't grow by telling them what's on your mind or giving a piece of your mind. That is not their growth at all, and it certainly doesn't help you at all. It makes you feel worse afterwards. But he's saying in the context of maturing and he's given fivefold ministries for the equipping, part of this understanding is to grow up, is to understand how do I speak truth. Truth is not information. Truth is a person of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Again, what's truth? Truth, the manifested reality of how God views something. When he, the truth, comes, he's going to guide you in what God sees, not what you think he's seeing or what you think you should do. He is guiding you by his own eye. He's guiding you through the filter of what God says. If you look into Proverbs 6, you find out a lot about God. Six things does God hate. For seventh, he's really upset. He burns with fire. He this, and the, the things that he talks about hate is an, an unequal balance and one who causes division among the church and, and one who speaks evil of his brother. And then seven, he's talking about how, how it was just destructive to the church of that. But we need to also understand that there's things that God loves as well. He loves the gates of Zion more than all the other dwellings, he said. He loves worshipers. He loves those who give to the poor. He delights in those who are willing to give of themselves for the service of others. So we see this is how God thinks and views. This is truth, how God views something. So he said when you're speaking, declaring something, and you're declaring it through the way God views something, then you will grow thereby and you'll grow up to the point of being so equipped and so mighty in stature in, in connection with Christ that you are complete and perfect. You find he goes into James. He said this is what a perfect man looks like is one that could bridle his own tongue. Perfect doesn't mean the fact that you have no flaws in your life, but it means the fact is that I recognize that my tongue, the power of life and death is in the tongue, and James describes that it's like a little rudder in a ship. You could have a big ship, little rudder, and it gives direction. A lot of us have misdirected what God wants to do is because our tongue is misdirecting what God is saying. 
And when we misdirect and say, God said, when he didn't say, we're using God's name in vain. We try not to even use the word in that in prophecy like God said, because we're prophesying by faith, not by inscription. Inscription where God had said it exactly word for word. But prophesying by faith means the fact is out of his word, I'm declaring things that's based upon his word and how God views things. So we understand when he said, by speaking the truth, we're not just giving information. If someone comes to you and says, have you heard the latest? That may not necessarily be truth. It could be a fact, but not necessarily truth. Fact and truth are at two opposite ends of the pole here. Because just because something is a factual and it happened doesn't mean God views it as truth. Truth is how God views it. He wants it to be, not the way that it is. It may be a fact that you have a family member on drug, but drugs, but truth is Jesus came to set them free. Whatever you live in is always your truth and your reality, and you get stuck there, and you continue to repeat about, I've got this family member, and they're always in drugs and always doing this destructive stuff. And so we're re what we're saying is, I'm now prophesying through the eyes of the devil. Because Revelation said, it is the accuser of the devil of the brethren. The word accuser is the same word as cursor. The cursor, or one who brings a prosecutorial accusation or a right to prosecute. Jesus came to set us free. The devil came to put us into bondage. So whatever we're prophesying, and it's not just saying, thus saith the Lord, but out of our innermost being flows rivers of life. And so we're saying things, and we don't realize we're declaring our, our rudder or our direction of our life. Your people might say, well, nothing ever good happens to me. It is self-fulfilling. Change the channel. Begin to declare what God's intention for your life is, which is, I may be right here at this moment, but I, the year from now, I'm not going to be there. This time next year, I'm going to be doing something completely different. I'm not going to be in this hole where I'm at emotionally, physically, or financially. From this point on, I am moving in a direction because this is the destiny that God said for me. Several weeks ago, I was, I was teaching us out of... Um, out of Psalms 139, where he says that in his book, we're written about. Not the book of life. It is a book of our DNA. It's a book of our destiny. That God has things for us. He's written a baby book for you all the way through your life. And though you may be at one point, and yet it's not in the book, you can say that that's, this is not God's intention for my life. My, his intention is for me not to be sick, not to be feeble, not to be weak, not to be fragile, not to be offended. Not to be upset. His intention for me is not to be poor. So his intention for me is that I would fulfill all of his intentions. That's blessing. So when we agree with the blessing of the Lord, that means that I'm saying the same thing that he says about me or says about one another. If you realize the Bible says that we're not our own, we're bought with a price, the blood of Jesus. That's in 1 Corinthians. Then when you look in the mirror and you say, look at that and you say, you old hag. Boy, you look pretty bad. What you have done is just curse something God created. Now, it may be a fact that you haven't done a very good job of taking care of what God created. That has to be repented of and say, I'm going to be better about this than I was before. And I'm going to eat right and do all those things right. But I am declaring that I am a creation of God. I am a new species. I've been brought out of darkness into light and life. So therefore, I'm here to fulfill the purposes of God. And the purpose of God is not for me to be in this position. <laughs> A few years ago, well, several years ago, when I started uh, teaching on this, um, my brother had gopher problems in his yard. If you read the book, you know where I'm heading. And uh, he would go out and he cursed the gophers every, every night. And they would be... There would be trails, you know, how they dig down and burrow up and they leave all these little humps of dirt all over the, the ground. And he said the more that he cursed them, the, the faster they multiplied. And he would put those poison pellets down there and they would get fatter. They would just eat. He said, they're living off this poison. I can't kill them. It's just the devil doing this. So his wife said, why don't you bless them? And he said, I'm not going to bless a rat. And he said, well, your brother's teaching that Everything that God created, he said, it was good. You're cursing something that God said was good. And Jesus says, bless and curse not. So how do you figure all that in? So he began to think about it, and he went out one evening, and 
He pushed down, tamped down all the rows, and he got out when nobody could see him. It was late at night, and he raised his hand up, and he said, Mr. Gopher, I don't know why God created you, but he said you were good. But I know that it's not good for you to come in and tear up my yard. So I am blessing you to fulfill the purposes of God, and I release you to greener pastures. <laughs> he said, I never believed it. The next day I came out, there was not another mound. There wasn't another furrow. There wasn't another tunnel. Went out the next night and said, well, they must have been sleeping or busy. Went out the next night, was not there. My neighbor came over and said, hey, man, I don't know what it is, but the gophers just have moved into me next, you know, <laughs> tearing up my yard. When you learn to bless and curse not and you declare God's intention for, then everything changes from that respect. I was sharing that story down in a, in a prison in, uh, down in um, Bastrop, where it was federal prison, and telling about the story how that you need to bless your guards, you need to bless those people there. A young man just ran out right then, got on the phone. I don't know how they do it. It was, it was medium security. And he called his mother up. Because I, the word was, you have been blaming people for why you're here. Until you stop blaming and accepting responsibility, you'll not be free. He had just sent his mother a letter telling her how much he hated her because she turned him in because he was so steep. He was out on drugs and dealing drugs. And he was telling her about how she, he wished she would die and just cursing, cursing, cursing. When he heard this, he dropped to his knees and began to repent, ran out and called his mother who he hadn't talked in a long time, and said to her, I'm sending you a letter, but I'm telling you, I don't mean that. God's got my heart and changed my heart. I realized that I would be probably dead and strung out somewhere else if you hadn't put me here. Well, in the middle of that, I was telling this gopher story. And uh, the chaplain sent me a letter back later and said, one of the cell blocks that was there was overrun by these giant, those big oriental roaches. They were just running over them while they were sleeping at night, running on the walls, and they were just everywhere. Can't you just feel it? <laughs> Selah. <laughs> and so one of the guys said, hey, that preacher in there is talking about blessing them. Let's just bless these things. One guy said, well, I, I don't know. You know, I, you know I, I'd rather kill them, actually, but... And he said, no, let's just bless them because they'd been spraying for it and doing everything and they couldn't use certain chemicals there and these things were just everywhere. So he just started blessing. Lord, you even created these, you, you created these cockroaches. And we don't know why you created them, but we know that everything you created, you said it was good. And we declare, Mr. Cockroach, you are good and you're blessed, but you were not created to bring disease to this cell block or to torment us while we sleep. So we release you to fulfill the destiny that God sent you to do. They went on to sleep. Next night, no cockroaches. The next night, no roaches. The next night, no roaches. And so the one of them was at lunch the next day, uh, the third or fourth day, and he said, the guy was telling me in another cell block, he heard him talking. He said, man, there's roaches just moved in and just crawling all over everything. We don't know what we're going to do there with them. When you learn to confront things, by blessing them into what they should fulfill instead of accepting that this is the way it is and how God views something, even in a bad thing, everything begins to change at that moment because we're seeing it through truth and not through fact. Most of the time, people will tell you the facts. They'll tell you what the doctor said. They'll tell you how long they've got to live. They'll tell you all the bad stuff and said, oh, yeah, but Jesus, Jesus can heal. We have magnified the problem more than we've magnified the solution. Therefore, we've come into an agreement with fact and not operating in truth. You shall know the truth, aletheia, and when you know the truth, the manifested reality of God, then you become as free as that truth you understand. Amen. This thing about understanding, being able to operate in truth and fact is so huge. Look with me in Numbers, the 13th chapter. They were practicing in the very beginning. God sent, brought Israel out of, uh, Hebrews out of uh, Egypt. And they were coming into the land that he had promised them. He actually promised Abraham this, the land of Canaan for over 400 years. It's 430 years now. He had brought them out with the tremendous miracles out of bondage, out of captivity. With the one thing in mind is that I want to give you this land, a land that you will be your own nation. You'll have your own place. You'll not be subservient to another nation. You'll live in the land that, uh, that I've called you to. So we, they come up to the land, and uh, Moses 
said, you choose out every one man from every tribe and go in. I want you to look at the land, spy out the land, and come back and report what you see because we, this is the land that God has given us. So let's pick it up and look at verse 25. They returned from spying out the land after 40 days. Now hold on to that because there were 40 days that they were in the land. They departed and came back to Moses and Aaron, the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness Paran and Kadesh, and they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. There was a, you, a sending word. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this, this is its fruit. Nevertheless, in other words, they agreed. It's exactly like God had said it was. There was houses that we don't have to build, vineyards that we don't have to plant, wells that we don't have to dig. It is already ready, made, ready to move in at that moment, just like God said. Now look at verse 28. And they said, yeah, the fruit is there. Everything's like God said. Nevertheless, which means never will I take any milk. I will take the less side of that. Never the less. The people who dwell in the land are strong city, and they're strong cities, and fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, or the Nephilim, they, the giants, Goliath came from that. We got our eyes fixed upon the giants. We saw the problem there. Oh, yeah, there's fruit there as well. Amalekites dwell in the land, the south, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea. These are all pagan, idolistic people along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the other 11 of them, and quieted the, actually 10 of them, Joshua was a good one. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Now notice, when you carry the eyes of blessing, your heart's set on truth, not fact. Because God said, this is truth, but this is what they were seeing. Circumstantial evidence is what causes most people to lose sight of what God is saying. But you don't understand my situation. Well, you don't understand God. You don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what he went through for you. When Jesus was on the cross, hanging on the cross, and he looked at those who were cursing him, instead of saying, let fire fall, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That's truth. He was hearing fact. But, they, but he was coming back with truth. Stephen, being sown, he looks up into heaven. He catches sight of Jesus standing at the right side of the Father. And instead of, Je instead of Stephen blaming the people whom he knew and he had once helped and served, blaming them for why they're doing what they're doing, he sees Jesus and the magnification of Jesus becomes greater than the taunts and the, and the hits that was coming at him and for the joy that was there. The understanding is that when we walk in truth, we're seeing things from the perspective of God and we learn to speak truth and not just fact. doesn't mean we deny the facts, but it just means that we will greater glorify, will greater exalt the one who is giving us truth. And notice Caleb says, we can go up immediately and do this. Look at verse uh, 32. They gave the children of Israel, these are the other the other 10, they gave the children of Israel a bad report. Was it a factual report? Yes. Was it a true report? No. They was explaining the facts, and the facts so overwhelmed them that they could not remember the truth. Right. To where you rehearse it in your mind so much and you take inventory around over your life and everything that's going on, and you come up with this solution. I am dead meat. Nothing good is working for me. One thing about blessings that I found out, it has a saturation point. Just in the same way that the Bible talks about the bowls of heaven, golden bowls of heaven, that the prayers of the saints go up and they fill the bowls, and then the bowls begin to tip out. In the same way that there is a saturation point with blessing, when you're prophesying over the situation, declaring to it God's intention there is a point of saturation that things begin to change. If it doesn't change immediately, that doesn't mean there's not something happening. If the doctor gave you medicine, he says, take this for six months, you wouldn't say, I took it one day and nothing's happened. You, are with, you understand that. I'm going to take this for six months, believing that something will happen. There is a, the sense of blessing is I'm going to continually with a saturation declare what I believe God wants us to have or wants us to see 
no matter what I see in the circumstantial in the meantime with that. Now, they gave the children, everybody else, children of Israel, a bad report, and they spied out saying, the land through which we have gone as spies, we are your representatives, we are now speaking for you, is a land that devours its inhabitants. You spent 40 days there, how do you know that? Because when we, when we miss God's insight to blessing, we start ruminating on the possibilities of failure. We start thinking about this is probably what's going to happen because we tend to respond to things according to our background and what's been in our background. I've seen many people that didn't get healed. So therefore, I'm moving into my background instead of moving into the insight and foresight of what God's saying. And so we respond to what our background has been instead of responding to what Jesus has already done. Now notice, look, he said to them, it's the land that devours our inhabitants, all the people whom we saw and are men of great stature. All we could report was about what we saw with the natural eyes. They had, didn't have revelation of who God is. The God who brought them out, parted the Red Sea, destroyed the firstborn of the, of the Egyptians, brought them out with a high hand, put them in a place where the cloud covered them in the day and a fire, pillar of fire at night, and now they come up saying, these giants are too big for us. There's times when you have to start thinking back at all that God has given and all that God has done, all that God has brought us through, and we start worshiping and giving him thanks to restore us to a position of blessing. Verse 33, when they saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came forth from the giants. They were the Nephilim. They, we were like them. Now notice, these aren't the giants speaking. We were like grasshoppers in whose sight? Our own sight. Proverbs 27, what does that say? As one thinks in his heart, so he becomes. So when we saw them, we started belittling ourselves, lowering ourselves in a position based upon how we felt about them or the circumstances. And because they saw themselves as grasshoppers and we were in their side as well, we just assumed that they saw us the same way. <coughs> Blessing causes us to come into a point of agreement with God. How can any two walk together unless they're agreed? Homo legale means to say the same thing. So if we're cursing our situation, and cursing means to place something in a lower position than what God has intended for it to be, that means we're now in agreement with the lower position than what God said we could be. We're now in agreement with a cursor or an accuser. But to say what God is saying means I may be here, but here's my conditions and here's what I'm getting out of and I'm moving out of this point. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but a, hope, a heart filled with blessing has vision to see where they can go to. That'll preach. It sure will. <laughs> look, at, look at chapter 14. All the congregation lifted up their voices. It's amazing. Ten guys caused two million other people to begin to feel depressed. The fallen nature of mankind is that we'll believe the negative and the fearful before we believe the truth and the, and the faithful. Let me just throw in while I'm here on this subject. One of the pastimes nowadays is to curse politicians. I get a little grieved when I see it on television, even though I don't agree with their politics and I'm a little, you know, don't have any feelings toward them and God hold my tongue for that. But they're still created by God. And so when we mock them and call them names, what the devil is always saying, yeah, I'll give them another one. They're this and they're that. We get real creative. And the first thing is we think that we're anointed for God by cursing them. When they just may be as deceived about things, especially the, the abortion and, and those kind of issues and the social issues and gay marriage and all that, they may be deceived and, and totally blinded because the God of this world has blinded their eyes. They can't see the hope of the gospel. And so we need to approach it. God, how do you view them? How do you see them? They were created in your image, and if I'm cursing them, I'm cursing your image, and it puts us on a hold, and it causes us to be on a stalemate and a stopping point, whether I like them or not. And God knows my heart. 
It's all I can do. The good thing about blessing is you don't have to believe it to do it. You simply have to be obedient to it. It changes things. <laughs> Several years ago, we had a person attending here, and, and she wasn't married. She was a librarian, and just we didn't know her very well. She would come from a distance out of town and drive in, and, and that she was always sending things to the staff and myself, very hurtful, and what we should be and shouldn't be, and doing all these kind of things, you know, and she was just harassing. And I had different ones of staff said, I don't know what we're going to do with this. You know, I try to get along with her and doesn't do this. And I've tried to talk when she comes early. And I mean, she comes late and leaves early. We couldn't have anything to do with her. So one day we, we have a call at the front. And I remember she came forward to my surprise. And I thought, good. Have I got a word for you? So I just made sure that I was the guy that was going to minister to her. Some of the staff, I remember, was sitting on the front row, and you could see him like bases loaded, pastors up to bat, and, and man, he's going to knock out of the park and get us all out of this misery. And so she came up, and she had her hands like says, I just need prayer. I said, okay. And I need to hear from God. Yes, you do. <laughs> I laid hands on her, and I thought, thank you, Jesus. You're the Lord who opens doors. I have the key of David. Everything looks like I got the green light and I'm ready to go. And I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> repentance. I'm thinking hell. I'm thinking God gets you. God is thinking mercy, love. So as soon as I laid hands on her, I, just, I, pro I said this over, you are a gift to this house. And I thought, I can't believe what I just heard of myself say. They're looking at some of the guys over there, and they go, oh, no, he struck out right there. Base is loaded right there. And I just, I couldn't stop it. I just kept going on, and God's called you to this place and loves on you, and he's wanting the mercy of God just to penetrate your heart and blah, 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 and all that. And I thought, oh, I don't want to look up. I'm going to go out the side door. I don't want to see it seemed like a long time, a little bit. She just fell to her knees, grabbed me around my, around my knees and said, I really need to repent and ask you to forgive me. I know I've been a thorn in your side here. I looked at everybody and go, I knew what I was doing all along. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, no. I said, we prayed over and blessed her and it wasn't long after that she moved out of town. You can take things that are a resistant and an obstinate but it's really opportunity. Opportunity to see things through God's eyes or it becomes an opportunity for the devil to use it to harass you and to torment you with. If you were a better pastor, then this wouldn't be a problem. If you were a stronger leader, this wouldn't be happening. And he just goes on and on and tries to bring accusation and, uh, against us and on, on who we are and our character and all those things. Now look at this next part with this. They come in the point. Verse 2, four, chapter 14, verse 2. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses. That's what brought on that story. <laughs> and Aaron, they complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Now you're talking about cursing themselves. You know what happened? They died in the wilderness. Between Egypt and promise. Between bondage and promise. They died died exactly where they proclaimed themselves to be. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Well, get ready. You will. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader, having a coup now, and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their face before all the assembly of the congregation, children of Israel. But Joshua, he shows up now. He was one of the good guys. He was the one that had the positive report. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. In other words, in repentance and grief and, and mourning. Now, look at verse 8. They spoke to the congregation, all of them, had a huge microphone evidently. The Lord delights in us. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Now, they're prophesying. 
If God's delighting in us and we've got this promise, then we can go in. We can do this. They're declaring over them the favor and the blessing of God in this situation. Look at verse 9. Only do not rebel against the Lord. When he uses that term, rebel against the Lord, it is the same as saying you rebelled against the promise. You, you cast out all that God said that this is your destiny and this is your life and you chose another path and you chose the, the path of cursing. We'll get into a few weeks later ahead, that path of Balaam, Balak. And you've chosen that path, therefore you have discounted yourself. You will not enter into the promises of God. Now, that's what he says. Do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. The problems you see are bread. They are not giants. They are bread. Give us this day our daily bread. The giants were opportunities for them to be strengthened because every time they would whip one of those giants, they would get stronger in authority and stronger in uh, in. Uh, in and motivation and that they knew that they had the right track and so they created fear among the giants and so on. But when they chose not to eat the bread and it was bread of adversity, they didn't embrace the adversity knowing that fact we're going to destroy this adversity, we're going to break through this into the promises of God, but yet they saw the adversity was a resistance to that. Now hear me, a lot of Christians think that when something is difficult, it's the devil, and when it's, di when it's easy, it's God. The devil can make it easy to go to hell. Just because something's difficult, it simply means I want you to grow in strength. The adversity there is to build some muscle. It's not there to keep you out of promise. It's there to help you be strengthened so when you get into promise, you can hold the land. Because they didn't even know what war was. And yet God was sending them to a place where they had no experience, but they would have to trust God in every aspect of winning this battle. Now, here's one of the issues with that. Was when discouragement sets in or disappointment sets into an individual, the next thing that happens is looking for blame. Moses and Aaron, they did it. That woman you gave me, God, she ate. No, it was the devil who made me do it. When the glory departs, all we can see is, is people that we want to blame and we lay fault to them. Exactly what the devil wants us to do is start cursing and laying blame at other people instead of saying, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, and I'm going to embrace the opportunities to break out of this by blessing my enemies and not cursing them. I'm going to speak over God's intention over something instead of speaking over my failure for this. If you were raised in a negative home, you probably revert back to the fact is, well, here we go again. If you weren't raised in an environment of faith, you will have to learn and practice what it means to bless till it gets so much in your spirit that it becomes more natural than unnatural. I grew up in an environment in a home there in Amarillo where that, uh, there, was, there was a poverty spirit among there. Right at the end of the month, my, my dad said, turn off the lights. We don't have the money for the light bill. And my mother said, leave them on because <laughs> we're believing God for fullness. And he had already seen her rebuke a tornado. He had already seen her rebuke a devil, a guy full of the devil, showed up in the yard one day. And so she looked at him and said, God told me. He said, okay. When you start fulfilling the, the cursing and the fear mongering, what he's saying is, I choose to believe what has been the, a cursor instead of believing the one who says he blessed everything that, it was, that he created. When you look through scripture, you find when God wanted to create something, he spoke to the substance from which he wanted to bring it forth, and he spoke to that substance, and he created it out of the dirt, and then he says, it is good, and he blessed it because and he blessed it so they can multiply. When God blesses something, it is for the idea of reproduction. When we bless something, even if it's a bad situation, we're not talking about reproducing the adversity. We're talking about releasing God into the situation to let him judge our enemies instead of us dealing with it. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. But every time we try to take it on and we start trying to manipulate the situation, try to make it work out how we want it to be and making calls and putting little hints and all these little innuendos, then what we're saying is I'm not trusting God. I'm trusting my ability to be connivers. 
I didn't say MacGyver, I said Caniver. That's a different one. <laughs> Saying, I don't, I don't trust God. So I'm going to help him out here a little bit. That's why we have, we have uh, the Arabs today, the Ishmaelites, because Abraham tried to help God out instead of allowing God to fulfill and work his promises all the way through the end. All right. There's times that God will bring us into opportunities that appears to us as a curse, and it can be, but we can turn it into blessing by how we respond to it, to the situation. The man was telling me the story. He was dealing with financial problems, and, and he would he had his wife around the table, and they were looking at their bills, and he said, well, I've just been cursed all my life. That's the way it is. Right when I, I can't get ahead and something happens, something comes along and I just can't get ahead. And I, I guess I'm just destined to be this all the way in my life. He began to, he got the tapes, he started listening to the CDs on blessing. And he realized what he was doing. He was agreement with, agreeing with the devil who was wanting to keep him in, a, in an impoverished situation. He began to speak over his finances and he started seeing his finances through, the, through God being the provisional. As Pastor Jim was saying this morning about God as our resource. I think there was something like that. That the word fullness there means to be God's a resource. He started looking at God through the eyes of what the Bible says about God instead of looking at himself as the failure. He quit looking at his ability to, to fail and his ability to not produce, and he started looking at God's ability to succeed and God's ab ability to be prosperous that. So he started blessing the name of the Lord and declaring over him because he read in where Psalms 48 where it says that as his name is, so is his praise. So when he was, he was agreeing with his situation as impoverished, he realized he was cursing the name of Jehovah Yireh, Jireh if you're from Texas. <laughs> that when he would just say, I'm destined for poverty, I'm destined this, I don't have enough of this, I don't have enough of that. What he was saying, I was cursing Jehovah Jireh, my God who supplies but when he started blessing the name of the Lord God, Jehovah, not meaning that you spend money foolishly and just do things radically, but he started sowing into what he wanted to get out of. And he started finding people in the same situation he was and give them a few dollars here and a few dollars there. And he started sowing into the very thing that he wanted to get out of and it began to, began to change. Diane and I were at a conference one time. There was a young man leading, a, leading worship. And I knew him. He's a friend of mine. He was a and the Lord said, I want you to sow money into him because of what I'm going to do in your son. And then he said, what do you have in your pocket? I said, keys. I got some keys. He said, no, in your billfold. Your billfold is going to get saved. So I said, well, I have a $100 bill tucked in the back, you know, for emergencies. He said, this is an emergency. Took the $100 out, gave it to him. He said, what's this for? And I said, I'm sewing into my son. We prayed right there. And at that time, Kevin wasn't where we, we wanted him to be spiritually. I can tell you today, he is powerfully in the, in, the, in the direction of the Holy Spirit. God's blessed him immensely beyond what we ever thought possible. We're just amazed when we hear all the reports with that. Was that the only thing? No, we had a lot of people praying with that. But I can tell you, God, you'll give towards what you're blessing and you withhold from what you're cursing. Amen. And the very thing that you bless, God can turn it around no matter what it looks like. And how, it begins to res how you respond to that means whether I really believe it or I, I'm cursing it, whether I'm blessing it. Now, look in Je Jeremiah, the 17th chapter. Verse, verse 5. This is a thus saith the Lord. Cursed is the one who trusts in man. I mean, I understand we have trust one another to a level, but my full trust is not upon any, any flesh and blood. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. That's manipulation. Man pulling on man is man pullation. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, this is the one who curses, and shall not see when good comes. When we're in a, involved in a cursing mode, we can't even see when anything good comes. We don't even recognize that God's hands on it. Joseph, when he was by his brothers sold into slavery, 
because he contended for the dream and he realized that God's hand was upon him, no matter what has happening at the moment circumstantially, he at the end began to say, you meant it for evil, but God intended for it to good. He kept his eye on the fullness of what God had said. For you shall be like a shrub in the desert, shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited, which means you can't get anything to grow there. The man who curses is one who has developed a lifestyle and a land where he can't get anything to grow. Nothing good will happen there. Now look at the verse 7. But blessed, happy, fulfilled is the word. The one who has the intention of God. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. I'm not hoping in people doing the right thing. My hope is in God. I'm never surprised at what people do. Still amazed occasionally, but I'm not. I mean, people come and go and they do all kinds of things. I'm still not surprised because my identity and my trust is not in what people could do. My trust belongs to the Lord no matter what happens from that. For he shall be, this is one who puts his hope in the Lord, he shall be like a tree planted by the waters which spreads out its roots by the river. He's in a fertile place. And will not fear when heat comes. When difficulty comes, the person who blesses don't have to worry about God's got them rooted in a deeper place than what's happening circumstantially. Drought can come, but he doesn't have to worry because he is known as one who blesses the Lord. His trust is in the Lord. His leaves shall be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding its fruit. Amen. Blessing and cursing. It just can't be a little bit. I heard someone the other day say, if you can't say anything good about anybody, don't say anything at all. That's not biblical. <laughs> Matthew, the 12th chapter. He says, Jesus is making a statement. He says that every idle word will have a just reward. How many have read that verse of scripture? Yeah. Yeah. I don't like it, but it's in there. But the word idle doesn't mean just flippant. It is the word argos, which means unproductive or unseating. Every word, though God has given us words to bring life, and we withhold them and not give blessing when it's in our power to do it, what we're saying is I'm holding onto the seed, and by withholding it that way, it cannot produce anything. I know I should bless them, but I don't think they deserve it. I don't want to bless them and them think that, that what they're doing is right. You don't bless all the time what they do, but you bless them by declaring over them that you are the promise of God and God's destiny in your life, and you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You can bless what God says about them without saying, you are a blessed drug dealer. I bless your business. You bless them to fall in love with Jesus in such a way that sowing drugs and doing all that kind of thing won't have much value at all. You are blessed of the Lord because you have the mind of Christ. You carry the heart of the Lord with that. Now let me just finish up with this in Genesis, Genesis 32. Because blessing changes. Changes the, the environment. But more than anything, it changes the person who's blessing more than even the one that you're blessed, that you're speaking blessing over. The background real quickly is Jacob had been deceitful, deceived his brother Esau, remember historically, and he has been out uh, with his, his uh, father-in-law Laban who had deceived him a number of times. So you find the family history. Abraham was deceptive. He, uh, Jacob was deceptive. And so Jacob had all, even though God's blessed him because of Abraham, deceptiveness was running through the family. And now his brother Esau and him are getting ready to have a confrontation. And Jacob is scared because Esau is coming with a lot of people. And he's coming fast. In Jacob's mind is Esau has come to get revenge. Look at verse, verse 20. Chapter 32, verse 20. I will say, and behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he, for he said, this is his servant telling Esau... I will appease him with the presence, with a present that goes before me, and afterward I will see if his face perhaps he will accept me. He's still trying to manipulate. I'll give him some money. I'll give him a gift. I'll see if I can do something to turn him from coming after me. He still has because he had learned how to manipulate and buy people off so long it was now part of his lifestyle and being. 
Look at verse 22. And he rose that night, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford Jabbok, and he took them, sent them over the brook, and set, sent over what he had ahead of them. And then Jacob was left alone, and he and a man, and it's known as an angel, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When he's saying wrestling, he's not talking about WWW, whatever wrestling that thing is, you know. He's not talking about that kind of wrestling. It's contending. He's, he's holding on contending, debating, struggling with him. So he was doing that until the break of day. When, and when he saw that he did not prevail, you're not going to with an angel, give up. When he found he couldn't prevail against him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So I, I get, you know, he was touching him pretty hard there and he's out of socket. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. This is the angel. But he said, Jacob said to him, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Unless you proclaim God's intention over my life. I don't want to go and face my brother without having the blessing of God in my life. I cannot confront adversity unless God's favor is on my life with that. And what does the angel say to him? So he said to him, what is your name? I thought, well, if you're an angel, you know what it is. He's wanting him to say it. In the Hebrew, it says, he said, Jacob, which means surplanter, deceiver, tricky Jake, all of the above. In other words, cheater. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob or cheater, but you will be called Israel, for you have struggled with God or prevailed with God, one translation says, and struggle with God and with men and have prevailed. Because he's saying at this moment, for you to enter into a place of, with God in blessing, there has to be a transformation from one nature unto a divine nature. From a cursing nature, a cheating nature, into a nature with God so that you're walking in the blessing of God and you're speaking as if God was blessing other people and blessing situations and blessings life. But as it is, you haven't trusted God. You manipulated the situation. You tried to do backdoor deals and cursing people and, and uh, you know, buying people off and, and bribing them. And God's saying, you prevailed with me. I am all you need. If you trust in God, you're blessed by God. If you trust in man, the best you can get is some favor with man, and they can turn on you in just a moment. He finishes up with this. He goes and meets his brother, and he finds out his brother wasn't coming to kill him, but his brother was coming to restore him. Part of the blessing nature is the ministry of reconciliation, where we can bless people Bless over. You don't have to be in front of them. I get calls and letters from, I got someone from Bulgaria called, in fact, and uh, wanting to translate the, the t CDs in, uh, in Bulgaria, and I said, that's fine, do it. And they were telling me the story how they had seen people that were just resistant to the gospel, and they began to bless them with the knowledge of the Son of God. They began to speak over them that you are sons and daughters of the Most High God. There they had so much of the, the, the old uh, Cold War and socialism in their background and resistant to, uh, to, to God itself. And now they're beginning to bless the nation, bless them and speak over them what God's intention. And they've seen a transformation among them and they're coming to the Lord. How would it be to bless your family I know I haven't taken much, I haven't taken any time to show you how to do that. It's got plenty of materials in the store for that. But when you do that, and there's a way to do that, that you're speaking, as it were, God pleading through you, God speaking through you. The judgment belongs to the Lord, but blessing belongs to the saints. That's not a verse, it just sounds good. <laughs> so don't go in there looking for it. He's called us, according to 1 Peter 3, Verse 9, he's called us to be a blesser, he said. And when we do that, then we're responding to the nature of God and responding to that nature, then he responds to us. The scripture says when, you're, when your ways please the Lord, he'll even cause your enemies to be at peace with you. What greater way to please the Lord and to do what he says? Bless and not curse. Bless what I've created and then we leave the judgment, we leave however God wants to deal with it up because it releases us from having to, do, to, to, to assign to them a, a penalty, to assign to them they don't deserve this. If I say that you don't deserve grace, then what I'm saying is I don't deserve grace. 
because the mercy I give is the mercy that I receive. And the judgment that I pronounce on you is also the judgment the Bible says that I have, I have pronounced on myself. So if I'm cursing, then, it, then now I'm saying my whole family is now in a place to where it can be cursed. But as the gatekeeper of our household and family for generations, when I bless, I have an expected that all of my generations shall be taught of the Lord and great peace shall be upon them. Because as you've done it to these, you've done it unto me. You have the wife that you bless and you have the wife you curse. That's good. All right. And you have the husband you bless or you have the husband you curse. When you say over them, I wish you were like this, or I wish you were this, or you're not like this when you should have been like that. What you're saying is, is I have diminished you into a capacity that release, re, refuses for God to be able to work in your behalf. No wonder it says, husbands dwell with your wives according to knowledge so that your prayers are not hindered. God doesn't see two of you, he sees one of you. And when both of you are blessing and walking together, there is a conjoined heart that says I re those, your prayers are stronger because you're not cursing one another. You stood together in that. And blessing becomes like seed sown. It accomplishes what he sent it to do. Stand with me, please. Father, we're so thankful that you've given us the tools of the kingdom of God so that we're not just walking through blindly. And I pray for every person today that is struggling in their life of, of false expectations or false feelings about who they are and a sense of, of missing something in life and a sense of failure, I pray over them right now that they would experience the might and the power of the Holy Spirit, that they would be filled with all of the wonder of God, that there would be hope arise within them, that they would see through your eyes and that you would restore and renew the ability to have vision, the ability to say, this is the day the Lord has made. The, today, the, the possibilities are endless, and God has good things in store for us. So I just declare over every one of you that you are created in an imaginative, creative way by the Creator, and He doesn't create junk. He doesn't create failures. And he wants to draw you closer in to where that you can hear and see what he says. Now, if you've, if you've never received Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life, at the end of this meeting right now, that's what's happening right now at the end of the meeting, I promise you, that I want you to come and have an opportunity. Or maybe you feel very distant to where I just think there's something there that I have trouble forgiving myself or having trouble getting a, a sense of freedom from. Then we can pray with you. And we're not going to spend a long time praying over your problem, rehearsing to God about your problem. He already knows it. But what we're going to do is declare solutions, prophesy changes, prophesy reformation, prophesy relationship and renewal by the Spirit of God. Father, I just thank you for elevating your son and raising him to the place, seated on the high place. And we choose to walk in the words of life and spirit by the power of the Son of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. I have one word. I want the minister.